to our clinical conversation series. My name is Alexander Lansky from Yale School of Medicine. I'm uh, the editor in chief of the new journal for the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention, uh, JSKY. Um, we're here to uh, discuss the Sky Expert Consensus Statement on Sex Specific Considerations in Myocardial Revascularization. Uh, published in the current issue of JSKY. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be joined by Dr. Don Abbott, who is professor of medicine at Brown University and co-chair of the consensus statement. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Barron, who is director of interventional cardiovascular research at Leahy Medical Center and deputy editor of JSKY. Dr. Jennifer Tremel is Associate Professor of Medicine at Stanford University, and Dr. Roxana Mehran is Professor of Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine, Mount Sinai in New York. So I wanna thank you all for uh, taking the time to join me today in this discussion on, on our consensus. Um, you're all co-authors, but you've all made some tremendous uh, contributions in this space uh, in your own right. So, what I would like to do to get uh, this conversation going is uh, to go through a few slides. Great. All right. So I think the, the first thing I'd like to do is to really uh, uh, commend the, the working group, the, the writing group, and uh, really highlight the fact that we had some true experts not just representing the United States, but also this is an international um, uh, consensus and represents many people from around the world. Um, so this is a comprehensive review of evidence from revascularization in uh, female patients. And it follows uh, an outline of a guidance document. We discuss the epidemiology of ischemic heart disease, we discuss some of the diagnostic tools to guide a coronary revascularization. And of course, we dive into revascularization of the whole spectrum of coronary syndromes from uh, chronic coronary syndromes to acute coronary syndromes, including uh, cardiogenic shock. We discuss some patient device and lesion specific revascularization issues as they pertain to female patients. And then we dive into some of the vascular access issues, bleeding, bleeding issues that are so relevant to our female patients. There's a really fantastic section on adjunctive pharmacology. And then we end the uh, statement on health status outcomes in female patients. I think one of the real strengths of this uh, consensus is that we highlight for each one of these sections, some critical gaps uh, in evidence. So why did we do this? I think uh, the purpose of this SKY consensus was first and foremost to, to summarize the available evidence on myocardial revascularization in our female patients. Secondly, we wanted to identify disparities and outcomes that are not necessarily addressed in current revascularization guidelines. And then we identified gaps in evidence that can prompt uh, prospective investigation. And we feel that this is, this is one of the key components of this consensus. So what I'm gonna do here is just give you a little bit of a tasting menu of some of the key issues that we discuss in this consensus. Of course, I'm not gonna be comprehensive given uh, the time limitation. Um, but first and foremost, we discuss the prevalence of cardiovascular disease and highlight some of the uh, differences here, particularly in the older age group with lower prevalence in the female patients. And then we discuss uh, overall the trends in cardiovascular mortality and what we see the excess mortality in the early 2000s and the tremendous improvement in mortality over time with increased awareness in terms of primary and secondary prevention. In terms of the uh, incidence and etiology of coronary disease and AMI in, in female patients, I think we do a good job in highlighting some of the uh, differences between men and women. And in particular, we call out MI with non-obstructive coronary disease uh, being much more prevalent in the female patient population. 
And again, we identify some of the gaps, um, specifically mechanisms, for instance, for decreasing non-traditional risk factors in female patients that result in improved outcomes. This is not something we necessarily think about in clinical practice. In terms of the diagnostics uh, and invasive physiology, we uh, discuss in quite a bit of detail the fractional flow reserve and uh, highlight some of the evidence showing that uh, females have higher FFR values for the same degree of stenosis compared to male patients, but that uh, women have a similar clinical benefit with FFR guidance uh, compared to male patients. And this really calls in question whether we should be validating and establishing some different thresholds uh, for FFR in female patients. Uh, we go into quite a bit of detail in terms of revascularization options for female patients with multivessel coronary disease. And we highlight here the evidence uh, based on randomized clinical studies that demonstrate that despite the fact that female patients, in fact, have lower syntax scores, they seem to do better with bypass surgery compared to uh, multivessel PCI. And this really uh, goes against uh, or is not necessarily highlighted in the current guidelines where there is true equipoise uh, between PCI and bypass surgery, particularly in the patients with preserved ejection fraction. What we point out in our consensus is that this is an area that requires more randomized evaluation for female patients specifically uh, comparing bypass surgery to multivessel PCI. In the context of ST elevation myocardial infarction, this has been uh, problematic uh, and continues to be problematic. This continues to be about a twofold higher uh, mortality rate in our female patients in hospital. We've seen that there is a higher mortality rate, particularly in the younger age group. And once again, we identify the gaps and specifically, uh, what are the optimal pathways of care for female patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction? And this is particularly relevant given the evidence uh, for the disparities in care uh, between uh, women and men. We see this time and time again. This is acute myocardial infarction without shock, where we see that women have fewer performance measures and undergo less uh, PCI. And in the context of AMI with cardiogenic shock, once again, we systematically see less angiography being performed, less PCI being performed, and less uh, mechanical circulatory support. And we've seen this over the last two decades. Um, this is new evidence coming from our, the first issue of uh, JSKY, so really uh, hot off the press. Um, showing in, in a rather large series of patients that for female patients, delayed use of mechanical support really leads to uh, dismal outcomes. We're looking at survival here and worse outcomes in female patients compared to male patients. And that escalating the number of inotropes prior to mechanical support once again leads to really terrible uh, survival rates and worse survival rates uh, for women compared to male patients. And while this is not definitive um, evidence, uh, clearly as we identify the gaps here that we should probably identify sex specific algorithms for the management of cardiogenic shock in our female patient population. So this is just, again, a tasting menu. And I think um, our, this consensus is, is a comprehensive summary of available evidence on myocardial revascularization in female patients. It identifies important gaps in knowledge as a result of underrepresentation or complete absence of data for female patients. It identifies areas where clinical decision-making may remain ambiguous, and it certainly highlights areas of uh, need for additional prospective uh, investigation. So with that, I would like to... Uh...
kick off our, our conversation here and just open up, um, maybe first discuss some of the disparities in care. And I'd like to maybe ask Dawn to, to lead off the conversation, but do you think that our consensus uh, will in some ways address some of these disparities in care and kind of move the needle in that, in that way? Yeah, thank you, Alexander, for that summary of the important aspects of the document and new literature that's coming out. And really, it's coming out on a daily basis. I think one thing I learned from being an author on this consensus is that when we're looking at the outcomes of women and in and, and all of these different segments of the document, we're trying to retrospectively look at data that we need to collect prospectively. And I think one important um, lesson I learned from this is that we need to take care from the beginning to, to identify women for trials and include them here. I think our document's going to be critical at um, identifying areas for study and getting women into the system for trials. So I think it will reduce disparities in care in opening people's eyes to what's been lacking so far and having them look at uh, you know, the data they're using day to day in a different way to when they're applying it to patients. And I think that will definitely broaden out um, how women are being seen in the, in the cardiovascular arena. Jennifer, what, what do you think? Do you think this is gonna move the needle in terms of some of the disparities that we've seen? Yeah, I mean, I certainly hope so. I um, absolutely agree with uh, everything Don said, and um, you know, I think the the differences and similarities between women and men are um, numerous. <laughs> I mean, if you look at this document, um, you know, I, I felt like we almost couldn't put in everything there was to say about it, and. Um, I, I think that every interventionalist really needs to understand these things, like know these things and, and come at patients um, with that understanding. And, you know, I, I think one thing that's really important is um, who ultimately reads this, right? And, and who gets um, moved to read this. And, um, you know, 96% of our interventional cardiologists are men. Um, and we're all taking care of women. And, um, you know, I know that, um, you know, men care about these things too, but I think at times these kinds of documents are kind of thought, well, that's what the women are taking care of. Um, and you look at our panel, here we are taking care of this, but, um, you know, we're only a small group taking care of these patients and, and to only have a small group really understand all these granular details um, is not acceptable. Um, this is a document that I think everybody needs to read um, and understand so that they can approach their patients appropriately. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, turn this over to Roxana. You've, you've done huge monumental efforts in trying to change how we think about um, the outcome, the management of women, as well as the whole female community. How can we translate? So we've, we've documented this. How can we translate into something that is actionable? Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I think one of the most important and I think unique parts of this document, very different than others, is that for every single um, uh, for every single topic, we identify gaps. And the gaps are not small, they're huge. And they speak loudly and, and palpably regarding the, um, the need for prospective evidence. And, and I think one of the things that Dawn and, and Jennifer already have uh, talked about and we continue to talk about in that in this very monumental effort by everyone here is the need for more data, more evidence in women and not just white women, women of all backgrounds. And how do we do that by really organizing efforts to maybe design studies in women testing different strategies. And I think you're leading some of that with Dawn and on, on several uh, concepts. And I'm thinking about that as well. 
And it doesn't have to be, and we need to educate our male colleagues, but also remembering that sex concordance of treating women uh, with heart disease, who, women who treat women with heart disease, that concordance is actually great for women. Uh, there's good evidence on that. There's now surgical evidence that co sex concordance improves uh, the outcomes of women, especially for women. It's not the other way when men, women treat men, they still do better. No, but I mean, I think for sure, um, and unfortunately there are very few female cardiologists. And as you all know, we're working very, very closely with Skywin, with um, you know Women as One, and other organizations like ACC Women in Cardiology, AHA Women in Cardiology Council. Everyone is working hard to promote and dignify women in medicine, especially women in cardiology in leadership roles. I mean, I think I keep saying that maybe, maybe you and I in those days when we were working together, Alexandra, and I would come to your office and we would talk about that, we've lifted up some of those big rocks on the road, but the gravel is still in our shoes. And so until we get there where we could get more women in leadership positions to actually lead these trials for the right outcomes and making sure we have enough women, we're not gonna get there. And I think uh, you know the collective efforts of the incredible leaders right here tonight show that um, times are changing and it's a much better day and tomorrow will even be better. Thank you for that. Uh, very ins an inspirational. Suzanne, any, any comments on some of the disparities? You know, I absolutely agree with, with everything that Roxana, Don, and, and Jennifer have said. I think really, you know, the, the key here is going to be obtaining more prospective data and in designing these trials, making sure that we design a trial in a way that we can encourage women to uh, participate. And so that means being thoughtful about how we can get women to be involved in follow-up care, because as you know, women do everything. Um, there's a lot of caregivers, they're working jobs. And so we need to make sure that we're designing a trial that allows women of all socioeconomic statuses to participate fully in. I think in also looking at outcomes that are important to those women as well, um, it's not just you know the, uh, the, the traditional mortality, MI, um, repeat rehospitalization outcomes that we should be looking at, we really do need to be thinking about some of these patient-centered outcomes as well. Uh, things like quality of life, days out of the hospital, um, time free from medical attention, you know, whether that's rehab stays and things like that. So those things also need to be thought about when we're designing these, these prospective trials. Right, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because there's a whole section that you authored in our consensus that addresses that. And I think that's really important. So let me let me shift this a little bit, and I'm going to ask uh, each one of you uh, in your mind which what area of outcomes of women's outcomes in this interventional space do you think is most concerning? Is most uh, actionable? We where we need to to really step in and make a difference, and that may in fact change your practice. So Dawn, I'm gonna go back to you. Terrific. Well, I'll start by saying what I think is the strongest evidence for women is that devices work in women. We know stents work in women. We know atherectomy works in women. And maybe it's underutilized. We now know IVL works well in women. We have some more um, intravascular imaging data showing you know, women have as much calcium or more than men. Women have smaller vessels than men. I think we have the toolbox right. What I think is the major thing that I've gleaned from our document, the REVAS document, the chest pain document is women have more symptoms and less burden of disease when it is defined traditionally as epicardial coronary disease and more ANOCA plus coronary disease or spectrum disease. And we just don't have a good way to, you know, exactly phenotype women and what their symptoms are due to. So we keep going back to treating the epicardial coronary disease. And I'm sure that, you know, Jennifer has a lot to say about that, but um, that's one thing um, that we highlight in the document and that's highlighted in some recent guidelines that I think is really important. 
Mm -hmm. So I guess that's a perfect segue on to you, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, Anoka, Minoka, SCAD, I mean, those areas, um, you know, we have, they're great um, for, they're ripe for uh, study, right? And, um, you know, I think we're learning a lot about them very quickly. I, I'm, I'm actually very encouraged. I think there's a lot of people in the interventional community looking at these things. Um, you know, SCAD took a long time, it seems like, to get anybody to recognize. And, you know, um, with the help of, I think, you know, many interventionalists, uh, male and female on, um, you know, panels and, and that sort of thing, um, you know, the word finally got out. I think people are much better at recognizing it, kind of knowing what to do, having conversations about it. So, you know, I think it's a big area, but I also think that, um, you know, there's there's good interest in it and um, that we're moving in the right direction. I In looking at the document, I was kind of, or, you know, kind of going over it again. Um, the health-related um, quality of life outcomes probably concern me the most. I, you know, I, I think that's one that we're going to kind of forget about, but we could probably do better um, pretty easily if we put our mind to it. Um, you know, this is kind of after we've revascularized someone um, and how do they do, right? And um, women don't do as well, right? And it, it maybe is things like Suzanne brought up, you know, that, um, you know, they've got other demands. Um, we also know they have more psychological distress prior to events and after, and are we addressing those? Um, they're not getting referred to cardiac rehab as much. I mean, we've made a great effort in our community to make it even female friendly um, to go to cardiac rehab because usually you'd go and it'd be a bunch of old guys and it's like, I don't fit in here. Um, you know, so I, I think that's an area where I'd really like to see some improvement in it. I think part of the problem is it it starts to feel maybe out of our realm, right? Well, if I put in the stent, I'm good, you know? And it's like, who's going to address that then? Um, you know, and that's, the, the procedure takes 20 minutes, you know, but this is the rest of our lives. Yeah. Roxana, uh, what are the areas that concern you the most? And I think, I think what, thanks, Alexander. I think, you know, all of these, these are, there so much concerns me. I don't know where to begin. Uh, the big concern is the statistic, the daunting statistic that we've made no progress at all in the last 10 years, in the last decade, in improving um, out after a myocardial infarction. And in fact, there is an increase in the younger women with presenting with an acute myocardial infarction, both in the US and Canada. I think these, the, the, the statistics are daunting for women uh, and um, we have less awareness of all of these things. Uh, we were better off 10 years ago when there was the big red, uh, you know, go red for women um, campaign. People were beginning to think about it. And it's kind of like we're no longer thinking about it. There's less awareness. The uh, socioeconomic uh, divide is tremendous. Uh, there is also a digital divide. And we're in a digital world with a digital divide and a very, very difficult thing. And women are disproportionately challenged by uh, the socioeconomic issues. They're mostly single mothers in, in low socioeconomic regions of the United States, not in low socioeconomic uh, arenas. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot. But everybody, I always say, everybody needs a Jennifer Tremel in their cath lab so that they can actually evaluate and give women diagnoses. If you listen to one of her lectures where she presents and explains uh, the the uh, microvasculature and the evaluation and understanding flow, and then really trying to explain that to your patients so that they don't think they're crazy with their syndrome. And now that we know how to diagnose it, now we've got to think about how do we treat this? How can we improve outcomes of these women? To me, that's a huge, huge low hanging fruit that we absolutely must address. You talked about cardiogenic shock and and you. Jennifer talked about um, rehabilitation. All of these things go hand in hand. We're just referring less and less women to therapies that we know would be beneficial for them. And lastly, I wanna say that the quality of life measures 
have been based on what's important to men. We haven't sat down to talk about is the quality of life different than that of a, a man? And are your measures, Suzanne, wrong? Because you, your Seattle Angela questionnaire and all these other things are talking about things men do, not things that women care about, like getting to childcare, doing laundry. Who asks that? or taking the kids and walking the kids to school, all those kinds of things that are important for women. And we are not, we're not really following those. We're not looking at those. So I think we need to stop comparing women to men. We need to just study women prospectively for the outcomes that matter to them the most. Excellent. So let me, let me shift uh, my next question. Um, Suzanne is gonna be, if you had to do one trial, in one area that covers all our consensus, what would that be? I only get to pick one. Each <laughs> one. Like, wow, that's a tough one. That's, that's a little hard. I, you know, look, I, I think as everyone said that one of the things that I was blown away was by how much, how many gaps there really are in the evidence of what of what's going on there. Um, I think for me, the, the thing that stood out the most, and if I had to design a trial. Hopefully I'll get to do that someday. That'll be really cool. Um, I think really was looking at uh, women's outcomes with regards to cardiogenic shock. Um, we know that, you know, women present, you know, women present with STEMI, we see cardiogenic shock, heart failure, right ventricular, you know, infarction more often with these, with these women. We know they're less likely to get uh, mechanical circulatory support, um, but yet they may be that group that derives, you know, more benefit from earlier mechanical circulatory support. Um, and since we know cardiogenic shock can be, is, is, has such a high mortality associated with it, I think really understanding how, how women uh, do in the setting of cardiogenic shock and is there a different, a sex specific algorithm that would be, that we should be actually following in this patient population, I think could have a huge, a huge, absolutely huge impact um, with regards to outcomes for women. Yeah, totally agree. Couldn't agree more. Jennifer, uh, I sort of, I think I know what you're going to say in terms of the one clinical trial, but what area would you, uh, would you investigate? Oh gosh, I didn't know you were going to ask me to. <laughs> I was like, phew, God, I didn't get that one. <laughs> um, I, well, I, you know, this is off the cuff of just what we're talking about, but I, I actually, um, and I, this isn't a clinical trial either, but I, I think Roxana's point about um, our questionnaires and the way we're actually studying patients is failing to study women. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, coming up with uh, sex appropriate ways of actually um, measuring, um, you know, health outcomes uh, would be very valuable uh, because every time we do a study, it is limited by the tools that we have um, to do that study. Uh, and so I would fix that problem. Okay, <laughs> do you wanna weigh in? Sure, sure. Um, I would like to see a study where we just get as much data as we can from the interventions we're doing. So just do a study where we're routinely collecting information about both the epicardial and microvasculature and pre and post intervention, and then looking at different interventions to try to improve outcomes in those patients, including women that have more than one disorder. I think that would be very important. Yeah, so more broad based. Yeah. All right, let, can I uh, just maybe shift the, the conversation a little bit? And, uh, you know, Roxana, you on the guidelines that just came out 2021. You know, I have to say, I was impressed that right up front, you're, you're, you're dealing with disparities, sex, and racial disparities, and right off the bat. Um, do you think the guidelines address sex based? issues um, adequately? Um, do you think that our, this consensus is, um, you know, helps or amplifies that? Um, you know, what's your, what's your perspective on that? Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, it's a tough question, uh, you know, and, 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 and it's the guidelines are really a, a 
huge amount of work by large numbers of people who basically look at the evidence and it's really very much evidence-based. And then when there is no evidence, there's some consensus around that. And unfortunately, just due to the fact that we enroll so few women in our clinical trials, we never have enough evidence for a single clinical trial to give the class one, you need to have for class one evidence, you need at least one to two or two clinical trials. And then of course you need meta-analyses that actually show for the smaller trials that actually uh, show the evidence as well. These are impossible to have for women. Um, and until we notice and focus on clinical trials for women rather than for making inclusion criteria that would then bring in women. So if you do a study on angina with non-obstructive coronary disease, you're gonna have 60, 70% women. If you do a, a TAVR study with a small annulus, you're gonna get 70 to 80% women. And those are the kinds of things that I wanna be involved in. I wanna make sure that my inclusion criteria or my exclusions don't exclude women and my inclusions include more women. Mm -hmm. And either we focus on them 100% or we, uh, we, do, we do these other manipulation of inclusion and exclusion criteria to answer questions that would then be important for women. But I also think we need to re-understand and re-evaluate how we're looking at endpoints. Um, uh, and I think the endpoints and when we talk about patient-centered outcomes are, have to be somewhat sex-specific if we're talking about women. And those, maybe those very, very um, traditional endpoints no longer work for women. And I think we just don't know what's important and what's not because we just never have had that much data. But I think the times are changing and I think we're all working hard to design studies that would include more women, but more importantly, also women of multiple backgrounds. If you think we don't have enough women in our trials, Imagine how few of African-American, Hispanics, um, and other races, uh, the racial disparities are even more profound uh, than the, the gender disparities. And I think that uh, we're, we put all of them in one bucket. Oh, women compared to men. Well, within the women, there are you know, African-American, Hispanic with different cultural and important different um, issues and risk factors. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and um, it looks daunting and, and like, oh my God, we're never gonna solve this. So we're walking before we run by doing some of these um, interesting trials that would include more women. And then also thinking about uh, trials that would have just women, because one day I'd like to see guidelines for women. Mm -hmm. And until we get there, we need to build the evidence and it's gonna be up to us. And I think we'll do it, hopefully in my lifetime. Yeah, it's ambitious, but uh, you know I'm with you. So Dawn, I'm going to give you as the co-chair of the uh, consensus document. I'm going to give you the last word, um, and maybe just to put in context this consensus document, given the 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 updated guidelines that just came out, and how do you see these complement each other? Yes, thank you. I think not only the revascularization guidelines, but the chest pain guidelines that uh, just came out also really did a phenomenal job at um, you know, really mentioning that women may have different features to really stop using the term atypical for describing symptoms that individuals have and talk about possible angina and what that encompasses for, for individuals. I think if you take the, those two new guidelines and then ours is extremely complementary because the large guidelines and the working groups don't have time to delve into the data, the strength of the data. Um, as Roxana was saying, they, they can't even think about going into recommending different things for men and women. And that's where our guideline really supplements the knowledge. So you can go to those guidelines, but then when you really wanna know, do the guidelines apply you know, equally to men and women, you can go to our, consensus document and look at the individual sections and see where the proof is really strong and where it's not. So I hope people will read it. <laughs>
So I want to thank you all. I think this was a great, great session. I, I, I want to see this consensus as a companion to the, to the uh, guidelines. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your contributions on the consensus and, and thank you for all the work you continue to do on a daily basis to, to advance the field. Thanks so much.